Crime and Punishment, Part 5, Chapter 3 Peter Petrovich, she cried. Protect me, you at least. Make this foolish woman understand that she can't behave like this to a lady in misfortune, that there is a law for such things. I'll go to the Governor-General himself. She shall answer for it. Remembering my father's hospitality, protect these orphans. Allow me, madam, allow me. Peter Petrovich waved her off. Your papa, as you are well aware, I had not the honour of knowing. Someone laughed aloud. And I do not intend to take part in your everlasting squabbles with Amalia Ivanovna. I have come here to speak of my own affairs. And I want to have a word with your stepdaughter. Sophia Ivanovna, I think it is? Allow me to pass. Peter Petrovich, edging by her, went to the opposite corner where Sonia was. Katerina Ivanovna remained standing where she was, as though thunderstruck. She could not understand how Peter Petrovich could deny having enjoyed her father's hospitality. Though she had invented it herself, she believed in it firmly by this time. She was struck too by the business-like, dry, and even contemptuous menacing tone of Peter Petrovich. All the clamour gradually died away at his entrance. Not only was this serious businessman strikingly incongruous with the rest of the party, but it was evident too that he had come upon some matter of consequence, that some exceptional cause must have brought him, and that therefore something was going to happen. Raskolnikov, standing beside Sonia, moved aside to let him pass. Peter Petrovich did not seem to notice him. A minute later, Lebeziatnikov too appeared in the doorway. He did not come in, but stood still, listening with marked interest, almost wonder, and seemed for a time perplexed. Excuse me for possibly interrupting you, but it's a matter of some importance, Peter Petrovich observed, addressing the company generally. I am glad indeed to find other persons present. Amalia Ivanovna, I humbly beg you as mistress of the house to pay careful attention to what I have to say to Sofia Ivanovna. Sofia Ivanovna, he went on, addressing Sonia, who was very much surprised and already alarmed. Immediately after your visit, I found that a hundred-rouble note was missing from my table, in the room of my friend Mr. Lebeziatnikov. If, in any whatever you know and will tell us where it is now, I assure you on my word of honour and call all present to witness that the matter shall end there. In the opposite case, I shall be compelled to have recourse to very serious measures, and then you must blame yourself. Complete silence reigned in the room. Even the crying children were still. Sonia stood deadly pale, staring at Lutzin and unable to say a word. She seemed not to understand. Some seconds passed. Well, how is it to be then? asked Lutzin, looking intently. I don't know. I know nothing about it, Sonia articulated faintly at last. No, you know nothing, Lutzin repeated, and again he paused for some seconds. Think a moment, mademoiselle, he began severely, but still as it were, admonishing her. Reflect, I am prepared to give you time for consideration. Kindly observe this, if I were not so entirely convinced, I should not, you may be sure, with my experience, venture to accuse you so directly. Seeing that for such direct accusation before witnesses, if false or even mistaken, I should myself in a certain sense be made responsible. I am aware of that. This morning I changed for my own purposes several five per cent securities for the sum of approximately three thousand roubles. The account is noted down in my pocket book. On my return home, I proceeded to count the money, as Mr. Lebeziadnikov will bear witness, and after counting two thousand three hundred roubles, I put that in my pocket book in my coat pocket. About five hundred roubles remained on the table, and among them three notes of a hundred roubles each. At that moment you entered, at my invitation, and all the time you were present, you were exceedingly embarrassed, so that three times you jumped up in the middle of the conversation and tried to make off. Mr. Lebeziatnikov can bear witness to this. You yourself, mademoiselle, probably will not refuse to confirm my statement that I invited you through Mr. Lebeziatnikov solely in order to discuss with you the hopeless and destitute position of your relative, Katerina Ivanovna, whose dinner I was unable to attend, and the advisability of getting up something of the nature of a subscription, lottery or the like, for her benefit. You thanked me and even shed tears. I describe all this as it took place, primarily to recall it to your mind, and secondly to show you that not the slightest detail has escaped my recollection. Then I took a ten-rouble note from the table and handed it to you, 
by way of a first instalment on my part for the benefit of your relative. Miss Lebeziatnikov saw all this. Then I accompanied you to the door, you being still in the same state of embarrassment, after which, being left alone with Mr. Lebeziatnikov, I talked to him for ten minutes. Then Miss Lebeziatnikov went out, and I returned to the table with the money lying on it, intending to count it and to put it aside, as I proposed doing before. To my surprise, one hundred ruble note had disappeared. Kindly consider the position. Mr. Lebeziatnikov I cannot suspect. I am ashamed to allude to such a supposition. I cannot have made a mistake in my reckoning, for in the minute before your entrance, I had finished my accounts and found the total correct. You will admit that recollecting your embarrassment, your eagerness to get away, and the fact that you kept your hands for some time on the table, and taking into consideration your social position and the habits associated with it, I was, so to say, with horror and positively against my will, compelled to entertain a suspicion, a cruel but justifiable suspicion. I will add further and repeat that in spite of my positive conviction, I realise that I run a certain risk in making this accusation. But, as you see, I could not let it pass. I have taken action, and I will tell you why. Solely, madam, solely owing to your black ingratitude. Why, I invite you for the benefit of your destitute relative, I present you with my donation of ten roubles, and you, on the spot, repay me for all that, with such an action. It is too bad. You need a lesson. Reflect. Moreover, like a true friend, I beg you, and you could have no better friend at this moment. Think what you are doing, otherwise I shall be immovable. Well, what do you say? I have taken nothing, Sonia whispered in terror. You gave me ten roubles. Here it is. Take it. Sonia pulled her handkerchief out of her pocket, untied a corner of it, and took out the ten rouble note and gave it to Lutzin. And the hundred roubles you do not confess to taking, he insisted reproachfully not taking the note. Sonia looked about her. All were looking at her with such awful, stern, ironical, hostile eyes. She looked at Raskolnikov. He stood against the wall, with his arms crossed, looking at her with glowing eyes. Good God! broke from Sonia. Amalia Ivanovna, we shall have to send word to the police, and therefore I humbly beg you meanwhile to send for the house porter. Lucin said softly, and even kindly, Got the barmazig! I knew she was a thief, cried Amalia Ivanovna, throwing up her hands. You knew it? Lutsin caught her up. Then I suppose you had some reason before this for thinking so. I beg you, worthy Amalia Ivanovna, to remember your words, which have been uttered before witnesses. There was a buzz of loud conversation on all sides. All were in movement. What? cried Katerina Ivanovna, suddenly realising the position, and she rushed at Lutsin. What? You accuse her of stealing? Sonia? Ah, oh, the wretches, the wretches! And running to Sonia, she flung her wasted arms round her and held her as in a vice. Sonia, how dared you take ten roubles from him? Foolish girl, give it to me. Give me the ten roubles at once. Here! And snatching the note from Sonia, Katerina Ivanovna crumpled it up and flung it straight into Lutzin's face. It hit him in the eye and fell to the ground. Amalia Ivanovna hastened to pick it up. Peter Petrovich lost his temper. Hold that mad woman! he shouted. At that moment, several other persons, besides Lebeziatnikov, appeared in the doorway, among them the two ladies. What? Mad? Am I mad? Idiot! shrieked Katerina Ivanovna. You are an idiot yourself, pettifogging lawyer, base man. Sonia, Sonia take his money. Sonia a thief. Why should give away her last penny? and Katerina Ivanovna broke into hysterical laughter. Did you ever see such an idiot? She turned from side to side. And you too! She suddenly saw the landlady. And you too, sausage eater! You declare that she is a thief! You trashy Prussian hen's leg in a crinoline! She hasn't been out of this room! She came straight from you, you wretch! And sat down beside me! Everyone saw her! She sat here by Rodion Romanovich! Search her! She's not left the room! The money would have to be on her! Search her, search her. But if you don't find it, then excuse me, my dear fellow. You'll answer for it. I'll go to our sovereign, to our sovereign, to our gracious Tsar himself, and throw myself at his feet, today, this minute. I'm alone in the world. They would let me in. Do you think they wouldn't? You're wrong. I will get in. I will get in. You reckoned on her meekness. You relied upon that. But I am not so submissive, let me tell you. You've gone too far yourself. 
Search her. Search her. And Katerina Ivanovna, in a frenzy, shook Lutsin and dragged him towards Sonia. I am ready. I'll be responsible. But calm yourself, madam. Calm yourself. I see that you are not so submissive. Well, well, but as to that, Lutsin muttered, that ought to be before the police, though indeed there are witnesses enough as it is. I am ready. But in any case, it's difficult for a man, on account of her sex. But with the help of Amalia Ivanovna, though, of course, it's not the way to do things. How is it to be done? As you will. Let anyone who likes search her, cried Katerina Ivanovna. Sonia, turn out your pockets. See, look, monster, the pocket is empty. Here was a handkerchief. Here is the other pocket. Look, do you see? Do you see? And Katerina Ivanovna turned, or rather snatched both pockets inside out. But from the right pocket, a piece of paper flew out, and, describing a parabola in the air, fell at Lutzin's feet. Everyone saw it. Several cried out. Peter Petrovich stooped down, picked up the paper in two fingers, lifted it where all could see, and opened it. It was a hundred-rouble note folded in eight. Peter Petrovich held up the note, showing it to everyone. Thief! Out of my lodging! Police! Police! yelled Amalia Ivanovna. They must to Siberia be sent! Away! Exclamations arose on all sides. Raskolnikov was silent, keeping his eyes fixed on Sonia, except for an occasional rapid glance at Lutsin. Sonia stood still, as though unconscious. She was hardly able to feel surprise. Suddenly the colour rushed to her cheeks. She uttered a cry and hid her face in her hands. No, it wasn't. I, I didn't take it. I knew nothing about it, she cried with a heart-rending wail, and she ran to Katerina Ivanovna, who clasped her tightly in her arms, as though she would shelter her from all the world. Sonia, Sonia, I don't believe it. You see, I don't believe it. She cried in the face of the obvious fact, swaying her to and fro in her arms like a baby, kissing her face continually, then snatching at her hands and kissing them too. You took it? How stupid these people are! Oh dear, you're fools, fools! She cried, addressing the whole room. You don't know, you don't know what a heart she has, what a girl she is. She take it, she? She'd sell her last rag. She'd go barefoot to help you if you needed it. That's what she is. She has the yellow passport because my children were starving. She sold herself for us. Ah, husband, husband, do you see? Do you see? What a memorial dinner for you. Merciful heavens. Defend her. Why are you all standing still? Rodion Romanovich, why don't you stand up for her? Do you believe it too? You are not worth a little finger. All of you together. Good God. Defend her now. At least. The wail of the poor, consumptive, helpless woman seemed to produce a great effect on her audience. The agonised, wasted, consumptive face, the parched, blood-stained lips, the hoarse voice, the tears unrestrained as a child's, the trustful, childish, and yet despairing prayer for help was so piteous that everyone seemed to feel for her. Peter Petrovich, at any rate, was at once moved to compassion. Madam, madam, this incident does not reflect upon you, he cried impressively. No one would take upon himself to accuse you of being an instigator or even an accomplice in it, especially as you have proved her guilt by tilling out her pockets, showing that you had no previous idea of it. I am most ready, most ready to show compassion, if poverty, so to speak, drove Sofia Semyonovna to do it. But then why did you refuse to confess, mademoiselle? Were you afraid of the disgrace, the first step? You lost your head, perhaps. One can quite understand it. But how could you have lowered yourself to such an action? Gentlemen, he addressed the whole company. Gentlemen, compassionating and, so to say, commiserating with these people, I am ready to overlook it even now, in spite of the personal insult lavished upon me. And may this disgrace be a lesson to you for the future, he said, addressing Sonia. And I will carry the matter no further. Enough! Peter Petrovich stole a glance at Raskolnikov. Their eyes met, and the fire in Raskolnikov's seemed ready to reduce him to ashes. Meanwhile, Katerina Ivanovna apparently heard nothing. She was kissing and hugging Sonia like a madwoman. The children, too, were embracing Sonia on all sides, and Palenka, though she did not fully understand what was wrong, was drowned in tears and shaking with sobs as she hid a pretty little face, swollen with weeping, on Sonia's shoulder. How vile! A loud voice cried suddenly in the doorway. 
Peter Petrovich looked around quickly. What vileness, Lebeziatnikov repeated, staring him straight in the face. Peter Petrovich gave a positive start. All noticed it and recalled it afterwards. Lebeziatnikov strode into the room. And you dared call to me as a witness, he said, going up to Peter Petrovich. What do you mean? What are you talking about? muttered Lutsin. I mean that you are a slanderer. That's what my words mean, Lebeziatnikov said hotly, looking sternly at him with his short-sighted eyes. He was extremely angry. Raskolnikov gazed intently at him, as though seizing and weighing each word. Again there was a silence. Peter Petrovich indeed seemed almost dumbfounded for the first moment. If you mean that for me, he began, stammering. But what's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? I'm in my mind. But you are a scoundrel. Oh, how vile. I have heard everything. I kept waiting on purpose to understand it, for I must own even now it is not quite logical. What you have done it all for, I can't understand. Why, what have I done then? Give over talking in your nonsensical riddles. Or maybe you are drunk. You may be a drunkard, perhaps, vile man, but I am not. I never touch vodka, for it's against my convictions. Would you believe it? He, he himself, with his own hands, gave Sofia Semyonovna that hundred-rouble note. I saw it. I was a witness. I'll take my oath. He did it. He, repeated Lebeziatnikov, addressing all. Are you crazy, milksop? squealed Lutzen. She is herself before you. She herself here declared just now, before everyone, that I gave her only ten roubles. How could I have given it to her? I saw it, I saw it, Lebeziatnikov repeated, and though it is against my principles, I am ready this very minute to take any oath you like before the court, for I saw how you slipped it in her pocket. Only like a fool, I thought you did it out of kindness. When you were saying goodbye to her at the door, while you held her hand in one hand, with the other you left, you slipped the note into her pocket. I saw it. I saw it. Lutzen turned pale. What lies, he cried impudently. Why, how could you, standing by the window, see the note? You fancied it with your short-sighted eyes. You are raving. No, I didn't fancy it. I know I was standing some way off. I saw it all. And though it certainly would be hard to distinguish a note from the window, that's true. I knew for certain that it was a hundred-rouble note. Because when you were going to give Sofia Semyonovna ten roubles, you took up from the table a hundred rouble note. I saw it because I was standing near then, and an idea struck me at once, so that I did not forget you had it in your hand. You folded it and kept it in your hand all the time. I didn't think of it again, until, when you were getting up, you changed it from your right hand to your left, and nearly dropped it. I noticed it because the same idea struck me again, though you meant to do her a kindness without my seeing. You can fancy how I watched you, and I saw how you succeeded in slipping it into a pocket. I saw it, I saw it. I'll take my oath. The Beziatnikov was almost breathless. Exclamations arose on all hands, chiefly expressive of wonder, but some were menacing in tone. They all crowded round Peter Petrovich. Katerina Ivanovna flew to Lebeziatnikov. I was mistaken in you. Protect her. You are the only one to take her part. She is an orphan. God has sent you. Katerina Ivanovna, hardly knowing what she was doing, sank on her knees before him. A pack of nonsense, yelled Lutzin, roused to fury. It's all nonsense you've been talking. An idea struck you. You didn't think. You noticed. What does it amount to? So I gave it to her on the sly on purpose. What for? With what object? What have I to do with this? What for? That's what I can't understand. But what I am telling you is the fact. That's certain. So far from my being mistaken, you infamous criminal man, I remember now, on account of it, a question occurred to me at once, just when I was thanking you and pressing your hand. What made you put it secretly in her pocket? Why do it secretly, I mean? Could it be simply to conceal it from me, knowing that my convictions are opposed to yours, and that I do not approve of private benevolence, which affects no radical cure? Well, I decided that you really were ashamed of giving such a large sum before me. Perhaps, too, I thought, he wants to give her a surprise when she finds a whole hundred rouble note in her pocket. For, I know, some benevolent people are very fond of decking out their charitable actions in that way. Then the idea struck me, too, that you wanted to test her, to see whether when she found it, she would come and thank you. 
then too that you wanted to avoid fangs, and that, as the saying is, your right hand should not know. Something of that sort. In fact, I thought of so many possibilities that I put off considering it, but still thought it indelicate to show you that I knew your secret. But yet another idea struck me, that Sofia Semyonovna might easily lose the money before she noticed it. That was why I decided to come here and call her out of the room, and to tell her that you had put hundred roubles in her pocket. But on my way I went first to Madame Kobilatnikov's, to take them the general treatise on the positive method, and especially to recommend Piedrit's article, and also Wagner's. Then I came here, and what a state of things I find! Nor would I, could I, have all these ideas and reflections, if I had not seen you put the hundred rouble note in a pocket. When Lebeziatnikov finished his long-winded harangue with a logical deduction at the end, he was quite tired, and the perspiration streamed from his face. He could not, alas, even express himself correctly in Russian, though he knew no other language, so that he was quite exhausted, thoroughly drained after his heroic exploit. But his speech produced a powerful effect. He'd spoken it with such vehemence and such conviction that everyone obviously believed him. Peter Petrovich felt that things were going badly with him. What is it to do with me if silly ideas did occur to you? He shouted. That's no evidence. You must have dreamt it, that's all. And I tell you, you are lying, sir. You are lying and slandering from some spite against me, simply from pique, because I did not agree with your free-thinking, godless social propositions. But this retort did not benefit Peter Petrovich. Murmurs of disapproval were heard on all sides. Ah, that's your lie now, is it? cried Lebeziatnikov. That's nonsense. Call the police and I'll take my oath. There's only one thing I can't understand. What made him risk such a contemptible action? Oh, pitiful, despicable man. I can explain why he risks such an action, and if necessary, I too will swear to it. Raskolnikov said at last, in a firm voice, and he stepped forward. He appeared to be firm and composed. Everyone felt clearly from the very look of him that he really knew about it, and that the mystery would be solved. Now I can explain it all to myself, said Raskolnikov, addressing Lebeziatnikov. From the very beginning of the business, I suspected that there was some scoundrelly intrigue at the bottom of it. I began to suspect it from some special circumstances known to me only, which I would explain at once to everyone. They account for everything. Your valuable evidence has finally made everything clear to me. I beg all, all to listen. This gentleman, he pointed to Lutzin, was recently engaged to be married to a young lady, my sister, Avdotya Romanovna Raskolnikov. But, coming to Petersburg, he quarrelled with me, the day before yesterday, at our first meeting, and I drove him out of my room. I have two witnesses to prove it. He is a very spiteful man. The day before yesterday, I did not know that he was staying here, in your room, and that consequently, on the very day we quarrelled, the day before yesterday, he saw me give Katerina Ivanovna some money for the funeral, and as a friend of the late Mr. Marmenadov, he at once wrote a note to my mother, and informed her that I had given away all my money, not to Katerina Ivanovna, but to Sofia Semyonovna, and referred in a most contemptible way to the character of Sofia Semyonovna, that is, hinted at the character of my relations with Sofia Semyonovna. All this, you understand, was with the object of dividing me from my mother and sister, by insinuating that I was squandering on unworthy objects the money which they had sent me, and which was all they had. Yesterday evening, before my mother and sister, and in his presence, I declared that I had given the money to Katerina Ivanovna for the funeral, and not to Sofia Semyonovna, and that I had no acquaintance with Sofia Semyonovna, and had never seen her before. Indeed. At the same time, I added that he, Peter Petrovich Lutsin, with all his virtues, was not worth Sofia Semyonovna's little finger, though he spoke so ill of her. To his question, would I let Sofia Semyonovna sit down beside my sister, I answered that I had already done so that very day. Irritated that my mother and sister were unwilling to quarrel with me at his insinuations, he gradually began being unpardonably rude to them. A final rupture took place, and he was turned out of the house. All this happened yesterday evening. Now I beg your special attention. Consider, if he had now succeeded in proving that Sofia Semyonovna was a thief, he would have shown my mother and sister that he was almost right in his suspicions, that he had reason to be angry at my putting my sister on a level with Sofia Semyonovna, that, in attacking me, he was protecting and preserving the honour of my sister, his betrothed. 
In fact, he might even, through all this, have been able to estrange me from my family, and no doubt he hoped to be restored to favour with them, to say nothing of revenging himself on me personally, for he has grounds for supposing that the honour and happiness of Sofia Semyonovna are very precious to me. That was what he was working for. That's how I understand it. That's the whole reason for it, and there can be no other. It was like this, or somewhat like this, that Raskolnikov wound up his speech, which was followed very attentively, though often interrupted by exclamations from his audience. But in spite of interruptions, he spoke clearly, calmly, exactly, firmly. His decisive voice, his tone of conviction, and his stern face made a great impression on everyone. Yes, yes, that's it, the Beziatnikov assented gleefully. That must be it, for he asked me, as soon as Sofia Semyonova came into our room, whether you were here, whether I'd seen you among Katerina Ivanovna's guests. He called me aside to your window, and asked me in secret. It was essential for him that you should be here. That's it, that's it. Lutzen smiled contemptuously and did not speak, but he was very pale. He seemed to be deliberating on some means of escape. Perhaps he would have been glad to give up everything and get away, but at that moment this was scarcely possible. It would have implied admitting the truth of the accusation brought against him. Moreover, the company, which had already been excited by drink, was now too much stirred to allow it. The commissar at Clark, though indeed he had not grasped the whole position, was shouting louder than anyone and was making some suggestions very unpleasant to Lutzen. But not all those present were drunk. Lodges now came in from all the rooms. The three Poles were tremendously excited and were continually shouting at him, The pan is a latchstack! and muttering frets in Polish. Sonia had been listening with strained attention, though she too seemed unable to grasp it all. She seemed as though she had just returned to consciousness. She did not take her eyes off Raskolnikov, feeling that all her safety lay in him. Katerina Ivanovna breathed hard and painfully, and seemed fearfully exhausted. Amalia Ivanovna stood looking, more stupid than anyone, with her mouth wide open, unable to make out what had happened. She only saw that Peter Petrovich had somehow come to grief. Raskolnikov was attempting to speak again, but they did not let him. Everyone was crowding round Lutsin, threats and shouts of abuse. But Peter Petrovich was not intimidated. Seeing that his accusation of Sonia had completely failed, he had recourse to insolence. Allow me, gentlemen, allow me. Don't squeeze, let me pass, he said, making his way through the crowd. And no threats, if you please. I assure you it will be useless. You will gain nothing by it. On the contrary, you will have to answer, gentlemen for violently obstructing the course of justice. The thief has been more than unmasked, and I shall prosecute. Our judge is not so blind, and not so drunk, and will not believe the testimony of two notorious infidels, agitators and atheists, who accuse me from motives of personal revenge, which they are foolish enough to admit. Yes, allow me to pass. Don't let me find a trace of you in my room, said Lebeziatnikov. Kindly leave at once. Everything is at an end between us. When I think of the trouble I've been taking the way I've been expounding, all this fortnight. I told you myself today that I was going, when you tried to keep me. Now I will simply add that you are a fool. I advise you to see a doctor for your brains and your short sight. Let me pass, gentlemen. He forced his way through, but the commissar at Clark was unwilling to let him off so easily. He picked up a glass from the table, brandished it in the air, and flung it at Peter Petrovich. But the glass flew straight at Amalia Ivanovna. She screamed, and the clerk, overbalancing, fell heavily under the table. Peter Petrovich made his way to his room, and half an hour later had left the house. Sonia, timid by nature, had felt before that day that she could be ill-treated more easily than anyone, and that she could be wronged with impunity. Yet till that moment she had fancied that she might escape misfortune by care, gentleness and submissiveness before everyone. Her disappointment was too great. She could, of course, bear with patience, and almost without murmur anything, even this. But for the first minute she felt it too nearly. In spite of her triumph and her justification, when her first terror and stupefaction had passed, and she could understand it all clearly, the feeling of her helplessness and of the wrong done to her made her heart throb with anguish, and she was overcome with hysterical weeping. At last, unable to bear any more, she rushed out of the room and ran home, almost immediately after Lutzen's departure. When, amidst loud laughter, the glass flew at Amalia Ivanovna, it was more than the landlady could endure. With a shriek, 
She rushed like a fury at Katerina Ivanovna, considering her to blame for everything. Out of my lodgings! At once! Quick! March! And with these words, she began snatching up everything she could lay her hands on that belonged to Katerina Ivanovna, and throwing it on the floor. Katerina Ivanovna, pale, almost fainting, and gasping for breath, jumped up from the bed where she had sunk in exhaustion, and darted at Amalia Ivanovna. But the battle was too unequal. The landlady waved her away like a feather. What? I saw that godless calumny was not enough. This vile creature attacks me. What? On the day of my husband's funeral, I am turned out of my lodging. After eating my bread and salt, she turns me out into the street with my orphans. Where am I to go? wailed the poor woman, sobbing and gasping. Good God! she cried with flashing eyes. Is there no justice upon earth? Whom would you protect if not us orphans? We shall see. There is law and justice on earth. There is. I will find it. Wait a bit, godless creature. Polenka, stay with the children. I'll come back. Wait for me if you have to wait in the street. We will see whether there is justice on earth. And throwing over her head that green shawl which Mamelodov had mentioned to Raskolnikov, Katerina Ivanovna squeezed her way through the disorderly and drunken crowd of lodgers who still filled the room, and, wailing and tearful, she ran into the street with a vague intention of going somewhere to find justice. Polenka, with the two little ones in her arms, crouched terrified on the trunk in the corner of the room, where she waited trembling for her mother to come back. Amalia Ivanovna raged about the room, shrieking, lamenting, and throwing everything she came across on the floor. The lodgers talked incoherently. Some commented to the best of their ability on what had happened. Others quarrelled and swore at one another, while others struck up a song. Now it's time for me to go, thought Raskolnikov. Well, Sofia Semyonovna, we shall see what you'll say now. And he set off in the direction of Sonia's lodgings. <laughs>